Hello, YouTube family. This is Jana Marish. Today's episode is focused on encouraging your students to study abroad. And we have two great members of the UW Study Abroad team to do just that. Associate Director Lauren Easterling, she focuses on student programming, and Ben Summers, our Global Travel Security Manager, a really great person to know. And let's huddle up with UW Study Abroad. Hi everyone, we are here today uh, to talk to our study abroad folks and I wanted to introduce Lauren and Ben. Lauren and Ben, please say hello to our UW family. Sure, I will go first. I am Lauren Easterling. I'm the Associate Director of UW Study Abroad and I oversee um, student programming for, for study abroad, all the different kinds of student programming. And my name is Ben Summers. I am the Global Travel Security Manager working out of the Office of Global Affairs. And my role is really about supporting students, faculty, staff, and anyone else traveling overseas. That's awesome. Really excited to have this conversation with both of you since you both have such uh, you know, uh, unique perspectives in uh, the, the global study, global education space. Um, yeah, this is, this is going to be a great conversation. Um, yeah, maybe maybe if we were able to to get a little bit more of like a, a background, like where Lauren, where are you, where are you coming from? What's your background in terms of what has brought you to the study abroad office to UW? What's your story? Yeah, thank. First of all, thanks for having us. This is really fun. I, I love to talk about study abroad, so it's a delight on a rainy Friday morning to to be with you all today. Um, I was, uh, I studied at UW for undergrad. I grew up in Seattle, um, never thought I would go to school in the, you know, in the city that was basically in my backyard, um, but, but that's how it worked out. And I, uh, my sophomore year, I stumbled into an art history class. I didn't really know anything about art history, um, but I started to, to take these classes and I completely fell in love with the, the discipline um, and I remember this faculty member coming up and standing in front of the class saying, hey, uh, you could come to Rome with me in, in a year's time and you could look at all this stuff in person. And I thought, yes, that is what I want to do. So it worked really hard in the next year and I applied for the program. And so I ended up going to Rome for a quarter um, of my junior year. And it just put its hooks in me, just, just roam <laughs> and study abroad. And it basically kind of never let me go. Um, and uh, I just have kept trying to get back there ever since and finding ways to sort of marry academics and my professional life with spending time in Rome. Um, I ended up interning at the Rome Center. UW, University of Washington has a Rome Center. We have a campus in Rome. So I ended up getting to work there for a year um, as a student um, at the sort of end, you know, my, my senior year. And that's when I really got interested in international education because I got to watch the transformation of students arriving at the Rome Center from the airport with their bags, you know, all sweaty and discombobulated. And then I saw the transformation over the course of the quarter or the month or however long they were there where they became sort of like Romans. They became naturals. And I thought that was really, really beautiful. And I thought that was really a, a rewarding thing to be a part of. So when I came back to Seattle after that, I just sort of wrote an email to the city of Broad Off and said, hey, can I have a job? And they said, yeah, okay, sort of. And I just never left. <laughs> and that was that was just about 20 years ago now. So um, it has been my, my, my life's joy to work with students, to send them to places all over the world. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Ben, do you have an equally fascinating story <laughs> that comes? <laughs> Maybe not nearly as fascinating, but similar in many ways. Uh, so I also grew up in the area. I grew up on Bastion Island. Uh, went Ooh. to uh, school at university at the University of Washington many, many years ago. Uh, I also did study abroad uh, my junior year. Prior to entering UW, I had done some personal travel back to South Korea, which is where I was born. I was adopted from South Korea, and I just had this interest of learning more about the place where I was from. So I, I went in high school a couple of times to, to South Korea, and when the opportunity presented itself at UW to do a, 
longer study abroad program, give myself half a year there, I jumped at it. Um, had a really transformative experience, uh, similar to, to Lauren, and I think many of our, our students who go overseas, um, and that kind of shaped the pathway forward from there. So post leaving UW, I moved to South Korea and I lived there for, for several years. Uh, came back to the US, worked in nonprofits on the East Coast, very much missed Seattle, missed being able to see water and green things and not have to drive for an hour to be on what feels like a mountain, uh, even though it's not. Uh, so really felt the pull of Seattle and moved back about six years ago. And I started working at an international exchange organization and having always uh, been interested in international experiences and helping people to have international experiences. So when the opportunity to come back to UW, uh, specifically in a role that supports global travel was presented, I, I was really appealing and I, I jumped at it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my one minute story. That's awesome. Well, Ben, I know that uh, the global travel security has been around for a while. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that program and um, just a little bit of history about, you know, um, about global travel security? Sure. Yeah, it's interesting because this whole notion of universities needing a designated person to support students while they're on study abroad, it hasn't always uh been around uh, health and safety and the responsibility for health and safety for a long time lived within study abroad offices. And of course, study abroad offices, they do lots of other things besides supporting student health and safety. So I think the realization started to come around maybe around the 2010s, mid 2005 to 2010, maybe that this could really benefit universities and certainly benefit study abroad offices. Um, so this position, the Global Travel Security Manager position, was actually created at the University of Washington way back in 2010. And UW was an early adopter, considered an early adopter in this space. Uh, they were the sixth university to have a position like this put in place. And that has now grown to well over 90 universities having somebody in a position uh, such as mine. Um, so UW was kind of leading the pack in that way. Um, the role has really, I think, expanded. My understanding of it is ex expanded somewhat from being student focused to supporting the campus in a much wider and broader sense. So beyond supporting students who go on study abroad, uh, this position also supports UW faculty and staff while they're overseas doing research or at meetings or conferences, or whatever it may be. Um, as well as all other forms of international travel. We have student athlete groups going on international trips and you know, my office works with, with those groups as well. Um, so it's really become something that was from you know, living within a study abroad office to still student focused, but living somewhere else to now kind of living somewhere else, but supporting the broader University of Washington campus um, as a whole. Thank you, Lauren is, you know, once you ha we have a lot of families, obviously that safety part, we're happy to lead with it, but we'd love to talk a little bit more about experientially. Um, are there other centers beyond Rome <laughs> to study abroad? <laughs> and can we go as staff? Like what is, <laughs> yes, <laughs> what happens? Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, we should talk about that. Um, yes. So, so, um, just to, I'll back things up just a little bit so I can be in concert, you know, with, with Ben's, you know, great, great backstory. Um, you know, study abroad has been around at UW for, for decades. And, you know, the whole study abroad landscape very much started as student exchange. I think that's probably what a lot of like, maybe our parents think of when they think of study abroad is like going to another university and then a student from that university comes and takes your your spot, and you're you're called exchange students, um, and and that is that is sort of the the um, the beginning of study of, of study abroad in, in our country um, around the world, and UW has has many of those those same types of programs still. We have about uh, I think seventy partner uh, universities around the world that students can go study at, but. The place where I think UW has seen an incredible amount of growth in the last you know, 20, 30 years is with faculty-led programs. So this is where we have faculty on campus who have a specialty 
in some kind of field department place in the world and they at our goodness of their hearts decide they want to take students somewhere together and take UW courses with other UW students. So it's it's a it's a different model than the exchange where you're in classes with maybe other Australian students or other Japanese students. And it has just kind of grown in leaps and bounds in the time that I have worked in in um, in study abroad at UW. And really, I, I attribute that to UW being a very kind of global university, a very global campus, and the faculty faculty that we attract here have so much expertise all over the world. So as the study abroad unit, our goal is to really tap into that expertise from across campus and work with, you know, really anyone who wants to come in and work with us to take students to places all over the world. So you know, we've had students on like archaeological dig sites in Israel. We've had students studying Spanish in Quito. We've had students, you know, studying landscape um, architecture in Nepal. And, and, and we still have the sort of traditional things you think about as like spending the summer in Paris. But we've really tried to create this portfolio where you can go and study French if that's what you're into. But you can also go and maybe do marine biology in the Galapagos Islands if, if that's your jam. So... I've really that is seen, definitely my jam. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've really seen, oh. you know, in my sort of 20 years here, I've really seen the, the portfolio grow from this like very narrow idea of what study abroad is to this really broad sense where we can find a program that can kind of fit any student's majors or duration or kind of language that they want to study. Um, and and we're, we're sort of a hub for, for this kind of thing. I think UW has been one of the top uh, Peace Corps sending universities for the last however many years. So it's sort of in the ethos here that 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 we we have a lot of um, international presence on campus, but we also have a lot of, you know, of ways, strings out into the world where you can go and, and you can experience different cultures, languages, you know, whatever it is you want to do. And to answer your question, yes, we have we have a UW Rome Center. And we also have a UW Leon Center. So Leon is a small town in northern Spain. So we send a lot of programs to both of those centers if those countries are of interest to you. How exciting. <laughs> so I'd love to figure out how we synthesize what Ben does in his world and what Lauren does in, in her world. And like the idea of how many students do you both support? during a given year, let's just say like this summer, what would that look like for for the both of you? Summer is coming. <laughs> we keep saying Yeah, that. summer is coming. There's so, many, <laughs> there's so many students who go out in the summer and early fall. It's it's a really popular time to go, which which makes a lot of sense. Um Ben, do you wanna do you wanna start that off or should I start off or Yeah, go for it, Lauren. I am happy okay. to jump in along the way. Okay, so so I think from a from a before you go point of view, we are the study abroad office is helping students find a program that's a good fit. So I was talking about all those different kinds of options, um, and then once students have been admitted to a program, that begins the orientation part of of getting ready to go. And there's lots of different facets to that. So there's the stuff that we as the study abroad office need to share with the student. There's the stuff that the program itself needs to share with the student, and then there's the stuff that Ben and his team, which I say that very loosely because it's mostly just Ben and I'm sort of on his team as like a as like a backup support person. But so we're all kind of thinking about this together. Um, there's this, there's the there's the global travel security piece of this that we want to share. And particularly, you know, in the last couple of years with the with the pandemic and with COVID, there is a lot that we need to prepare students for as they head out into a landscape that quite honestly looks very different than it did two, three years ago. Um, and and it is, it's been very manageable, but I'd say we, we have been working very closely on um, anticipating the situations that we would need to, to make students aware of as they enter into a study abroad experience in the midst of a, you know, of a still ongoing global situation. How does that, like, is Ben preparing all of these students <laughs> for all, for all things before they go? Well, there's a, certainly, as Lauren referenced, the pre-departure orientation component. I'm involved in those pre-departure orientations. I come in and do a health and safety piece uh, during these orientations. That covers things like helping students decode what their insurance is and how to work with 
with their insurance, how to contact their insurance if they need to access it while they're overseas. Of course, most undergraduate students understandably don't have a ton of experience working with insurance companies. Uh, so we try to help uh, kind of decode some of that complexity. Uh, there's also an emergency management piece. So if a student were to have a crisis or an emergency overseas, we kind of help them prepare for what their response would be, who they can contact, who they can call. Kind of, we want them to try to take away and think about maybe just a small handful of things. If this happens, I call this person. If this happens, I call that person. Um, and then we are on oftentimes the other end of the phone should a student have an emergency and need to reconnect with somebody at the university. Both Lauren and myself are on-call duty officers who have an emergency response phone that we carry around and we'll connect with students or faculty to help work through uh, a crisis with them. Um, so I try to help set the table a little bit for students in, their, in terms of their understanding of and some of the health and safety considerations while they're overseas. Uh, and as Lauren referenced, uh, COVID has kind of created a whole other chapter to that. Um, and that's been a big focus uh, as we've prepared students to, to go overseas this year. And we've had about 800 go so far. So pretty significant number. I would imagine that they're, you know, based on just past and current conflicts that are happening around the world, that you all are making real-time decisions based on, you know, who is in the area, what programs do we have planned or trips that we have planned. Can you talk about that process, especially as we're thinking about, right, like current global security and, um, and, and what's happening right now? Yeah, there's definitely kind of a 30,000 foot view where we've also looked, uh, especially as we were considering restarting study abroad after a year and a half of not having any programs, looking at what specifically the COVID situation was in all of these different countries where we were potentially going to have students. What did we then need to share with students and faculty who were leading programs? And in some cases, considering maybe the situation is, is looking like it's at a point where it's not safe to to have students there and making the difficult decision to to decide to close programs in, in that country or just put them on, on hold for a moment. When we do have students proposing travel to what we would consider high risk areas, so maybe areas where there is active conflict, uh, we would look a little bit deeper into the intelligence of, of that particular country and what factors create risk and then sit down with the traveler and kind of have a, a more in-depth briefing pre-travel briefing to help them kind of prepare for for travel to that specific place. So there's kind of the uh, more general view of considering feasibility of, of having programs from a safety and security perspective in a particular country. And then the more kind of granular conflict or incident specific briefing that we would need to have with travelers who are going to what we would consider a high risk area. My initial uh, reaction to what you're saying is uh, what I, I feel like families are probably like, well, how do I know? How do I get to know about all of this stuff as well? Um, you know, sending off your student um, 15 to 20 minutes away <laughs> versus maybe an out-of-state family is a little bit different than having to hear that your your husky is really really interested in going to japan <laughs> or to europe or south america and um could you talk about how you deal with ferpa with how um parents and families can learn more about what is going to happen to their students um it, that's a really helpful thing to know i think when you hear they're going to be away for a quarter or two. <laughs> um, and that, that is open to Lauren and to Ben. I can start. I think from a, from a sort of student development university success point of view, we are really trying to direct our advising and our material and our um, contacts to the students themselves. Um, we don't have any problem having conversations with parents. I, I do it all the time. Uh, and, you know, I, I can speak very, I, you know, generally about any program that we offer. I can tell you, you know, if you're a parent who's concerned and I, and it's a program in particular that I'm leading, um, I can tell you, you know, what our schedule is going to be day to day. And I can tell you where the students are going to be 
living, you know, what kind of housing they're going to be in. Um, I can answer a lot of questions about the structure and setup of the program that maybe don't pertain specifically to your, to, to their child, um, you know, and, and I'm also happy to talk to them about their child if, you know, I get the, the kind of consent from, from the student that, that that's okay. Um, so, it, you know, we provide as much about various programs, we provide as much information as we can up front. It's usually in the program brochure, but as the student is sort of digging deeper into the process, they're going to be getting more information, whether that's from the faculty who's leading the program, the provider who's offering the program, the exchange university that's hosting them. And it's kind of up to the student to decide, you know, how much they want to share with their with their loved ones, um, with their family members. And we really take cues from from the students on that because this is their opportunity. This is their study abroad. Um, this is their chance to go out and and gain the what I felt was really invaluable independence that, that I and confidence that I, I gained as a, as a student going and doing this kind of thing um, on my own for the first time. So it's a, it's a, it's a very um, student centered supportive process, but we, we love our, um, you know, our Husky parents and families and we want to make them feel safe and assured. Um, and, and Ben can speak to this too. We've been offering webinars for students who are headed out in each quarter and those are open, you know, if faculty and faculty, family members want to attend, faculty can attend too, and they do. Um, but if family members want to attend, they are more than welcome to sit in um, on, on those kinds of, of uh, briefings. And, you know, I think we get great questions from parents, you know, particularly about insurance, because as Ben said, it's like the least exciting thing that students are thinking about when they're going abroad, but it's in fact really important. And um, families are often, better versed in the world of insurance than than maybe students, at least as I was as a student, I didn't know anything about insurance. So I'll let, I'll turn it over to Ben. Yeah, just a, a bit about kind of the behind the scenes decision making process. You know, we, when it comes to study abroad programs are always revisiting, again, the feasibility from the health and safety perspective of programs. So if a student is joining a, a group collective study abroad program or doing an exchange with the university, that program has gone through some degree of vetting for safety and security. When there's an independent traveler, so a student who is proposing travel to say uh, Columbia, we would wanna look to see where that student is going, what his or her plans are, and then sit down with that student and kind of talk through again, any potential risks or safety considerations we would want that student to be keeping in mind. As part of that process, students are required to fill out what are called travel waivers or essentially, again, applications to travel in places that are considered high risk. Um, and then there's a whole travel safety and security committee that meets and reviews those. So there's a lot of different eyeballs looking at proposed student travel um, and the fact that we can get students to, to register their travel, which we require at the university, uh, it helps to and make sure that a lot, lot of different people are looking at uh, student travel and, and making sure that they're adequately supported before they jet off to wherever they're going in the world. So that's kind of the one mechanism we have to make sure that we have a chance to connect with students, discuss safety, security, those types of things. Yeah, that's, that's so important because the, the impact of studying abroad is so great. Lauren, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, the... You know, maybe some of the questions that you get from students, because I, I, you know, we, we understand study abroad to be a high impact educational practice. So really something that there is evidence that um, these these actions, these activities that students do in, in, you know, in addition to study abroad, right, doing an internship, um, participating in some sort of like first year seminar, um, make such a great impact on um, on students. Can you talk a little bit more about that experience? What do students ask about in terms of that experience? How do they reflect on that experience? Because I know that's a, such an important part of of um, of this experiential learning type um, of, of approach to education is that reflection piece as well. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's one of those things where you're sort of, you're learning skills that are gonna be so beneficial in your life, but they're sort of like soft skills, you know? They're not, it's not necessarily like, you know, learning to code or something, which uh, you can do that abroad, but, but um, it's sort of resiliency, it's flexibility, it's adaptability, it's 
how to have conversations and communicate interculturally with people that don't have similar backgrounds or histories as you and as a humanity, right? Like these are things that will serve us all very, very well um, is to better kind of understand one another and get along. And I think studying abroad is a beautiful way to start one's own personal journey to, to sort of learning how to interculturally communicate. Um, so we see students really coming back with those kind of skills. And there's, there's research in, in the field of international, international education about, about that. Um, we are also trying to find ways to connect students to sort of meaning making, whether that's documenting their experience somehow or using it in their resume um, when they try, try for that internship or try for that job. You know, we know employers look fondly upon seeing study abroad on a student's resume because they understand that it means a student has taken on a certain amount of independence and um, had, and has potentially had to navigate you know, difficult situations. I think any of us who studied abroad or traveled abroad have found ourselves in situations where we're like, hmm, how do I, how do I get out of this one? And you do, you know, and, and I think that inspires a lot of confidence in students. So those are the kinds of like wonderful skills we see come out of study abroad. And, you know, from a, from a point of view of um, questions that we often get, uh, I think one of the most common is that I hear from incoming students is um, how competitive is it? That's the question I always get 100% of the time. Is how, I, I think it's because students are like fresh off the heels of like applying for college and that was a, maybe a stressful process and competitive. And, and so what I always say to that question is we can find a program for really any student. We have 500 different opportunities that students can participate in. So that's, it's very possible for us to get students on a program that will work for them. Um, and it, so, so competitive competition is kind of a funny thing. Um, we do have some programs that do get a lot of students that are interested in them. Like we have an exchange at University College London. Students are like, I've heard of London. They have double-decker buses. They speak English. I want to go there. <laughs> Whereas we're like, maybe, you know, you want to go to University of Sussex, which is just outside London, far cheaper to live in. And it's like a quaint, you know, English village and has cool things to do. So, you know, it's, it's all about sort of like students thinking about what their goals are academically, thinking about where they want to be in the world, if they have a language that they want to improve or hone. These are all things that factor into making a decision about what kind of program you want to participate in. Um, yeah, so it, I mean, other questions that come up are, are um, a lot about cost. I think there's a misconception that it's going to be more expensive than, than studying on campus. And Th that can be true. Um, there are some study abroad programs that are um, that are more expensive than studying on campus, but a lot of them package together the housing, um, the instruction, the field trips. So if you were to take it, it, the actual numbers of what you pay to live on campus and to study at UW, and you compare them with with that of a, a program, say to Rome, you might be looking at coming out about about the same. Um, if you're an out-of-state student, there's there's many programs that are going to be quite a bit cheaper than than studying on campus. Um, our faculty-led programs, we we charge a program fee for them. We don't charge tuition, so you're looking at you know tens of thousands of dollars less than you may you may pay to to actually study abroad on campus. We also have a lot of scholarships and funding opportunities for students. So we have our own scholarship program that. Students don't even need to apply for. We just award the scholarship based on unmet need, based on your FAFSA. You don't have to do anything, um, which is which is pretty cool and has reached a lot of students. And we also have an advising team that helps students connect uh, funding opportunities that are specific to study abroad with, um, with the programs that they're applying to. So we've really tried to build out resources to confront some of these, whether they're real obstacles or perceived obstacles that students have um, around studying abroad. Um, I think the last thing I'll, I'll say to that is, is about um, the kind of courses that you can take. I, I think there's also perhaps a misconception that you're going to get behind in terms of your majors or minors if you study abroad. 
many, many of our programs are born out of academic departments. So you're getting major and minor credit that you would need in order to graduate in that program anyway. Big, big majors on campus like engineering, computer science, business, they all have their own study abroad programs that students can participate in to move towards those, um, the STEM majors too especially now that students are being directly admitted to, to some of these majors. Um, I think also academic advisors are saying, you've got time. You've got a quarter to take off and go study maybe um, art history in Rome for, for, for 10 weeks instead of you know having to get in all those sort of core curriculum courses that you need in order to graduate with a degree in engineering on time. Humanities, social sciences students, it's never been a problem to find <laughs> study abroad programs and courses to fit to fit their needs. So it, we're really trying to cover all of the all the bases. I appreciate that, Lauren. I just wanted to make sure that our out of state families heard how much uh, less expand like it is a great way to fill up summer, do something fun, and it might not even cost as much. I'm sure everyone's like doing this, like we'll figure that <laughs> can out. Can she say that again? Um, yeah, can she say that again? Um, I also appreciate the stretch that you don't have to do just engineering. You don't have to do just humanities. You can think about um, you can think about doing something that's an area outside of your major study. And um, and this very important thing that I feel like everyone is trying to rush through their academic journey, that they do have this time. They do have this one quarter. I'm I'm actually very curious, Lauren and Ben, when did you do like what at what time during your academic journey at UW did you say I'm going to do this study abroad thing what year were you in and kind of like your mindset when you decided yeah I want this adventure academic adventure <laughs> I think adventure is, is totally the right word and, and Jen as you were speaking I was thinking about for me starting in this role one of the most interesting things has been to see has been it, me being able to see just the vast variety of things that UW students are doing. There are students who are studying albatross populations off the coast of Scotland or you know, studying architecture in Copenhagen uh, or taking an ROTC language program in Taiwan. It's just there's so much diversity and so much variety, just kind of echoing. Uh, but what you and Lauren both spoke to kind of the possibility to find the right program fit for you. Uh, there's always the possibility to either find a program you may not think exists or to create your own. Uh, for me personally, I studied when I was a junior and I did my first half of my junior year. Uh, so the first two quarters of, of uh, my junior year, I, I went to South Korea. And it's always a little bit tricky because we're on quarters, they're on semesters or trimesters, but it always works out and credit transfers can work. And um, so I came back to Seattle in the depth of winter uh, and started up for spring quarter. I also went, when I was a junior, I went for spring quarter of, of my junior year for the first time. Um, and then I did that internship for a year. Uh, I think that was like a super senior year. Um, <laughs> and then as That's a- That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> they don't let you do that anymore. <laughs> this was a long time ago. Um, and then uh, I did, as a graduate student, I did an early fall start program. So at, at UW, we have a cool thing where, you know, we don't start school until, you know, almost October, the end of September. So we have this sort of space between the end of summer quarter and the beginning of um, fall quarter. And we run probably 40 study abroad programs during that time. So they're short three week opportunities. You earn five credits. So it's a it's a really wonderful way to dip your toe and study abroad or to dip your toe in a location or a subject that maybe you're not 100 percent, you know, as part of your 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 course of study. So I went to uh, Kyoto, Japan and studied um, Buddhist uh, architecture and art, Japanese Buddhist architecture and art, and which was not my focus at all. But for three weeks, it was just, it was a magical dream. I had never been to Asia before. I got to go with a, with a, an expert of, of Japanese art history. And um, it was, you know, as, as it all is, it's very transformational. So I think that's another thing I want to point out is that study abroad doesn't just happen during the academic year. It's not just autumn, winter, and spring. It's 
summer, it's early fall, it's spring break. So I think particularly for our students who maybe have responsibilities back home during the academic year, jobs or caretaking that they're doing, there are shorter options where you're not committing yourself to, you know, maybe what Ben or I did, which was a whole quarter or a whole semester. Um, you can go, you can have one of those really transformational experiences and not maybe take as much time away from, from being here in Seattle. Amazing. Or Bothell or Tacoma. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I'd love to uh, just ask for some really great travel tips for our families. <laughs> also secretly for myself. And <laughs> we'll, but, we'll both um, be taking notes. <laughs> we are, copious notes will be taken um, because I feel like you've talked about just the depth and breadth of uh, the study abroad program. Ben's uh, clearly like the person to talk about insurance with because I will do that later because he seems to know everything because that's the thing, right? You're like insurance, safety, <laughs> and then having fun and studying. Um, but as you've traveled, um, what is what's some really great four, four great tips to, to share with our families um, and students? Sure. Sure. So, you know, it is an interesting and kind of weird time to be traveling internationally. Uh, and, you know, we acknowledge that. But at the same time, things are becoming a lot easier. Uh, and, you know, and Lauren can speak to this. Having done a couple of overseas trips rather recently, things feel normal in other places. Um, and so really want to encourage people to resume international travel, even though it can feel really daunting. One way to kind of make it feel less daunting is just to do a little bit of research ahead of time. So when it comes to COVID specifically, since I think that's what so many of us are thinking about when we think about international travel, there are all kinds of resources out there to try to figure out what you need to do to get into a specific country, to move around safely within that country. Uh, I'll point to the State Department's website. They have a ton of great resources and from there can direct you to other official sources it's not the most exhilarating reading, but it, it's at <laughs> least the information that you feel like you'll need to know. Um, so that that's one piece. And the second piece, this is also, again, can feel a bit dry, but also just to, to know your insurance as well, uh, to know what kind of insurance coverage you have while you're overseas. Um, it's not, again, the most exciting topic, but if you end up needing it, you'll be glad you you did it and looked into that. Um, are we Are we doing four? Yeah, four. <laughs> also, um, Ben, I know it's not exciting to the students, but it's definitely exciting and also uh, necessary for the families because very much, very much. That's like, oh, that's my, I, that's I'm the expert on that one in the family, so I will make sure <laughs> they will know that. Well, kind of. So al yes, along those lines, uh, you know, it's less pertinent now, but it certainly never hurts to have trip protection. Uh, we saw, especially early on. Uh, in early days in the pandemic when we had students who were required to test for COVID before getting on a plane, sometimes they tested positive and had to rebook their flight. So having a ticket that's changeable or where you won't uh, incur too many penalties uh, always helps. Uh, yeah, and I guess, you know, the last one is really just to kind of goes back to my first point, which is international travels opening up again. And it's very much possible to traverse the world and to check off some of the places where you've been wanting to go. So, you know, don't let, I think at, at this point, whether it's monkeypox or COVID or one of those things that we are seeing in the headlines every day, deter you too much from, from pursuing travel at this point. You know, feel free to go for it. I think at this point, it's safe to say. Lots of, lots of things to track, but I think it's really reassuring to know that there are multiple offices on campus that are thinking about these things and guiding students through these processes um, so they can have that beneficial experience, right? They, so they can experience that, that impact to um, their perspective. So this is awesome. Thank, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you both for um, just sharing your stories and, and sharing some tips for our, our parents and families. Thank you so much. And we will definitely make sure all those copious links and resources will be added to the, this podcast. But what I am, um, I'm so grateful for the hopefulness and the encouragement of international travel. <laughs> ben said it was okay, everyone. So I think it's all good. <laughs> and Lauren, uh, like uh, 
the the rundown of those programs made me feel like I would like to go back to school or just go to these wonderful places. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and giving us this really great visual adventure in our head about how we can expand that Husky experience for our families, for our students, and uh, go global. Yeah. <laughs> Come see us in Schmitz Hall. We're there. You know, we're... We're, we're a little bit off campus, but we're, but we're there in, on the fourth floor. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you both so much. Thank you. The Husky Huddle Up podcast series is a collaboration between the University of Washington first year programs and parent and family programs to provide parents and families equitable access to information in support of their students' success. The Husky Huddle Up is produced by Chloe Giselle, a senior in the UW Cinema and Media Studies program.